Thank you. <clears throat> Item D2. Next, we will need to discuss possibly raising other fees to help address the board's budgetary issues. The possible fee increases are listed on page 65 of the packet. However, as we have discussed, the, legislative the legislature typically likes to see an analysis or study of appropriate fees and ranges before supporting any an agency fee increase through the legislative process. Staff and council are therefore recommending the following motion, which differs slightly from the materials in your package. Con conduct a fee study to determine the potential need for an appropriate fees for possible future legislative fee increase and direct staff to report back to the board on a possible legislative proposal based on the fee study. Does any of the board wish to make a motion? Do I have a second? So moved. I have a motion and a second. Is there any board comment? Nancy. Yeah, um, so we're proposing to do a fee study. So given the condition, how are, is staff doing the fee study? How are you paying for the fee study? We'll be, uh, contracting out for that fee study. Tanya, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, the fee study costs around $50,000, um, but they do require that the fee study be conducted by an independent organization to have validity for uh, confirming what our actual costs and fees are related to that. Sometimes a staff can do uh, what's called a desk audit, but it's typically when there's less, there, there aren't that many fees, it's not as time consuming. When you're talking about the number and the differences in different fee structures that you have, it's kind of complicated and so it's typical for boards, if they can, to contract out to have that done. So I just want to explain really quickly the difference between um, fees for applications and the renewal fee. The renewal fee, which is what we're moving, what we just previously moved, would support the, um, your operations. That's your operational line item. That's the revenue that you use to support your functions. The application fees are simply a reimbursement of the service that you provided when you processed that application. And that's why the renewal fee is actually the, probably one of the most, if not the, the most important fee that you collect and why we look at that so carefully in determining budget health because application fees come and go but renewal fees is consistent and, it, and it's used to project the health of your fund. So that is something you don't need to do a fee study but rather a fund condition analysis which your staff have aptly done in this case. But um, to determine how much time it takes to process an application, how much goes through, um, you know, background checks and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, that's very time consuming and given the urgency of your situation, I think staff's recommending that it be conducted by an independent firm. Another question. Um, so do we have a time frame on how quickly we'll turn around the fee study? The fee study will take about six months um, once we execute a contract. So a contract we would take about 60 to 90 days to get through the process and select a vendor. So that would be closer about nine months out. Any other board questions? Any public comment? Seeing none, Kayla, can you take the roll, please? Johnny Simpson? Aye. Kevin Albanese? Aye. Frank Altamura? Aye. Augie Beltran? Aye. David Diaz? Yes. Susan Granzella? Aye. Mike Layton? Aye. Nancy Springer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next is agenda item D3, information technology update. For that, I will turn it over to Board Member Susan Granzella, Information Technology Advisory Committee Member, and Deputy Chief Registrar Tanya Corcoran. Thank you. After such a serious discussion, let's go into another one now. Um, so, as you may recall, uh, Frank Altamira and I were uh, designated by our President Chair uh, to uh, serve on a two-person board member information technology sub advisory subcommittee. The purpose of the committee is to provide insight and guidance in planning, establishing priorities, and monitoring progress and costs of the board um, with respect to IT. We started this last year. We were able to give a, um, a few reports, and we're continuing this year. So <clears throat> on August 16th, we held our first meeting. Frank was drafted. He didn't 
really volunteer, but we, <laughs> we knew he had an IT background, and when that is made public knowledge, you're on. So Frank joined us, and, and Tanya and uh, one of the staff members, Raju, um, we held a meeting going over some of the board, pa the issues around um, what we were going to explain to the board uh, today, and then the state of affairs and what we wanted to do. I also had a separate meeting with Frank as he was drafted, um, and we had a separate meeting where I was able to explain to him the history, because if you think about it, when you're new to the board, um, the history of IT, and yes, I said the word breeze, um, the history is very important for uh, to bring him up to speed so that we can move forward, because it's very different than um, uh, separate businesses. So we're going to meet again in October, and um, before I turn this over to Tanya, because we have the review that Tanya is going to do, I wanted to thank Tanya for stepping up <coughs> without an IT background, and what she had to do was um, take over the IT department when our chief, or when the IT manager resigned, and when he resigned, it wasn't the easiest transition, all it never is, but, uh, she just went in and said, I'm going to find out what they're doing, I'm going to introduce myself, I'm, and we, we talked about this a little bit then, but the progress was incredible, and I wanted to thank you and acknowledge your effort in this area, because we are in the process of hiring another uh, IT manager, and, um, and, so, and the progress is very good. So Tanya, it's probably as much fun as a root canal, but you did a great <laughs> job. You did a great job. So I wanted to acknowledge that and turn this over to you. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Appreciate that. Um, so we'll start off. The IT update begins on page 70, but uh, going to the recruitment of our IT chief, uh, Jason Pachoni and I held the first round of interviews. It was two full days uh, a few weeks ago, and we comprised of both a written and an oral interview. So the top scoring candidates will move to the next round of interviews. Um, so we're looking at having those in mid-October, and that will include the registrar and um, Susan Grantella, who's also will also join us on that. So we are looking forward to getting that position filled. I am looking forward to getting that position filled <laughs> personally. Okay, so moving to our first item um, is the public data portal. Um, as you may recall, Rick, uh, when it, at the June board meeting, did a brief demonstration on the new public data portal. Um, since the board meeting, we have increased the functionality, and if you'll notice, that's bullet number two. We added the search capability um, specific to getting a complete list of contractors by classification. Um, so I've had a couple uh, members of industry reach out to me directly. I was able to walk them through it, and they said that's the information. It, it was very helpful, and they were very excited to have that. So I know that that's been, and Rick, you may have had some reach out to you as well, but everybody's been very excited to to have that information available, <coughs> um, where previously we had charged for that service. Now it's free and online. Um, I did want to also uh, point out, with the ADA compliance, this, uh, we have talked about this, we are compliant, we were able to certify that um, back to July 1st, but what you might notice in your board packet is some of our charts look different, so I'll point you to the strategic plan chart. It has a slightly different look and feel, has the same information, but we are looking at making our charts more readable and user-friendly for those um, uh, that need that, and so if there are some charts that you notice that are different, or if it's not conveying the information, you think it could be done in a different way, please let me know. We can always look at reformatting those as we go, but most of the charts we were able to keep as their current, um, in their current format, so just to let you know that. So moving to page 71 is a new item, and that relates to the website outage and the architecture modernization. Um, Dave had notified you all um, that at the end of July, there was a couple of days where we had an outage um, of some of our services. So the entire website was not down, but some of the online services were unavailable. And I know that affected permits and looking at that. Uh, Nancy, our apologies. 
communities. So what we did is we said we need to take a hard look at what we can do and what we can do quickly to mitigate this to avoid um, having any outages down in the future. So IT staff worked on a plan. We worked with our control agency, which is the Department of Technology, and looking at how we could um, craft our uh, architecture, our website infrastructure. Um, and so what we are creating, and you'll see in the diagram here, is really looking at a three-tier um, approach. And with that, you have the web environment. Um, so it's going to be, this is following our security best practices, but it also is meant to where we have some redundancy. So if one server is down, another server um, can be there. And it's also to look at load balancing. So if there are balancing issues related to that. Um, Department of Technology could have created this structure for us. It would have been at a cost of over $200,000. So we declined um, and we did work with the Department of Consumer Affairs. They have this same structure in place and so we're working with them to leverage their structure. It will not be at a cost. The costs that we'll see incurring will just be the fact when we're looking at um, creating, uh, having larger storage space um, related to that. And that's something that's our normal cost that we would be doing. But we'll provide more details to the advisory committee on actual costs. But we, we did not go with a $200,000 custom bill. We pay pro rata, we're using it for this. So any questions on that? Yes. Not, not a question, but just a statement that I think when the website went down, I think good part of that was that we became aware of how many building departments you check the license. Because for those that may not be aware, as you get a permit and you issue a permit, that's the first thing we do. We go in to see if that contractor is licensed. So when the website went down, I was getting a tremendous amount of emails, probably before you even knew, <laughs> that the website was down, what was going on. Um, the other part of that was is that um, it did appreciate that the license board did keep us abreast of what was going on. The awareness of what was the status, that you were working on it, keeping us posted, gave us an alternate way to get in to still check that license and keep us moving. It was truly appreciated and it was a great collaboration. So um, though it was not a good thing that happened, it did open our eyes to many things that we needed to have that fix and that you know we are doing what we need to do and um, just everybody collaborating together. So thank you for that. And I would just add that we're looking at having that in place by December 31st. Baird Cowan, who is the number two with the department's um, information office, he's coming out to CSLB. He's there two days a week, and that's his priority is to work with the IT staff to get this architecture in place. So I wanted to let you know that. Okay, so moving to pages 72 through 75. Um, this really shows our military audit findings, which we have talked in the past, but this is showing you what our remediation efforts are to date. Um, the chart below that, that goes on for the next three pages, is our IT system enhancements, and this is something Susan had suggested um, back in January, and so you're seeing that we have our running total of what we've, kind of the high level um, uh, tasks that IT has been involved in and carrying out. And so you'll see that we have, from our last board meeting, July through um, June of 2019, those are the new items related to that. Um, so as Susan mentioned, we're going to be meeting with the IT Advisory Committee in October to review our strategic objectives and priorities, um, and we'll provide a detailed update of the Executive Committee meeting. One thing that we've done over the coming weeks is to really get a list of all the projects um, and had an opportunity to meet with Registrar Froat to go over what are those priorities, and we'll be sharing that, discussing that as the IT Advisory Committee. Um, I'll just give you a preview. One is sole owner renewal, getting that online. We know that's, a, you know, online renewal is a priority. So with that, that ends my update. Are there any questions? I have a question. The target date for the online payments, and that would include renewals, applications, um, how is, you know, how solid is that? And can you give us a little background on that? because it would, online renewal fee availability will impact renewals. And so it would be great to get an update. 
Sure. Um, so December 2019, we are not going to meet that date, quite honestly. Um, what I found with talking to the IT staff is online, online renewals a little bit more complicated for our board than it is other boards and bureaus. Um, most other boards and bureaus that have it, they have a one signature requirement. And so with that, you don't have to have a way to pend um, a renewal and send it to multiple parties. And so with that complexity, it becomes really costly and a challenge because you have to set up like a account and you have to have a way in which to pen it, you know, as I mentioned, and to do that. So that's where um, it, it kind of has stalled. Um, but what we have found is with sole owner renewals, which is a large part of our population, there is a one signature requirement. So we can get that portion up quickly. Um, what we'd like to see is it will probably come through the ledge committee is to look at legislation to change it to a one signature for all of our licensees. Um, you know, really the renewal is a matter of collecting the money. There's not a continuing education component that needs to be signed off. And so that's something that we would ask the board at a future date to consider. And that way it would be easy for us to bring everybody online. So we'll, we'll discuss that more about the IT committee and the executive committee in a future board meeting. Thank you. Do we have any other board comment? Any comment from the public? Seeing none, our next agenda item, D4, Registrar's Report. Registrar Dave Folk, can you give us a report, please? Thank you, Chair Simpson. I've, I'm just going to report on our upcoming meetings. We are looking to hold committee meetings in Sacramento on November the 7th. The actual location will be determined at a later date. We may use our office, but if we're uh, expecting a, a large, um, large number of the public to attend, we may look for an off-site location. The next full, full board meeting will be December 12th in Sacramento. And we're looking at having a board meeting this spring, and that would probably be the second or third week of March. I will have Felice Jones, the executive office assistant, uh, survey all of you for your availability. And then the last board meeting for this fiscal year, uh, we're proposing June 3rd and 4th, and that would be in Newport Beach, and that would be a joint meeting with the Nevada Contractors Board. And that's the register update. Thank you, Dave. Do we have any board comments? Do we have any comments from the public? Okay, next let's go to agenda item E. For that, we're going to ask uh, enforcement. For that, we're gonna ask Committee Chair Nancy Springer for a report. Excuse me, Johnny, I'm sorry. I should have went right into my admin update. And oh. so if we could, if, okay. if we can skip okay. that. We'll I'll be step quick, back for one I quick. promise. Okay. <laughs> so the admin update is on page 80. Um, and this shows, the first chart shows, talks about our recruitment activities um, for the prior two fiscal years. I uh, just wanted to note that we promoted eight employees in our uh, last quarter of the, of the fiscal year. On page 81, the chart above displays our vacancies. And so we've averaged about 24 vacancies this fiscal year. Um, wanted to also note that, as you may recall, we had mentioned in our Sunset Review report um, the benefit to reauthorize our temporary help positions, we're known as our 999 positions. In July, we did complete the conversion of those temporary positions, so it's reestablished them as authorized positions. So you'll see it in, in all of the reports you're getting from this point forward, is it'll display as 428 positions. Um, so just to let you know that. On page 83 is, the, is our examinations, um, and it shows the list of those that DCA conducts and CalHR. Just wanted to note that our Enforcement Rep 2 exam, um, we give it twice a year, and our next exam is scheduled for October. Um, so nothing really to report on our facilities, but that's on page 84 and 85, if there's any questions there. And then just a brief update on our strategic plan. We previously discussed objectives 5.1 through 5.4, so I'm not gonna cover those, um, but I will brief you on 5.5 and 5.6. Um, and that's where we hired cooperative personnel services to conduct a study and make recommendations on whether we should stay utilizing our enforcement representative class series or use the statewide class series. Also, it was to look at salary differentials and higher cost 
of living areas. So the CPS study has been finalized and completed. The recommendation is to move the enforcement reps to the special investigator um, classification and our sworn enforcement reps to the investigator series and not to pursue a salary differential at this time because it does have significant pay increases moving to both of these classifications. So I just wanted to let you know that we have approximately 115 employees, 75 are ER1s and 39 are ER2s. Um, Dave and I informed the staff that we're moving forward with CPS recommendation and once transitioned employees will have an additional 7 to 12 percent earning potential and that's where it raises the cap of where they can they can go um, our next steps are to prepare the reclassification request so we're not the ultimate approver of this action it requires the Department of Consumer Affairs as well as Cal HR to uh, make those approvals but Dave and I had the opportunity to be both with the department and let them know um, you know the path that we want to choose they were supportive of that and we also had a meeting with um, Cal HR and they understand where we want to go so uh, we're very hopeful and confident that we are going to be able to move this forward but move it forward um, quickly but again it's not within our control you know it, there is a process to go uh, to go through um, but we're also going to be meeting and working with the union um, through our joint labor management task force and our transition plan so we with that, um, state rules require that employees be eligible when they move to another classification. And so employees, based on their education background and their experience, will end up transitioning and moving at a different time. And so with this large number of employees, I think that's going to be our biggest challenge is really looking at every individual employee, every individual scenario, uh, and then their experience, and, and knowing when they're going to be eligible and ready to make that transition. Um, so we're excited to work with the union on it um, and to make sure that we have a really good plan and a path moving forward on that. So what we've done in the interim as well, we've taken another step, and that's we're using the enforcement rep one um, position, and again, we had a majority of our enforcement rep ones, and we're, we have approval from DCA personnel that we can make those ER ones and ER twos interchangeable positions, and what that means is employees can be promoted in place, and they're promoted in place when they're, they're ready, so they've taken on additional responsibility, they have the eligibility, and they're acting independently. And so that will give some temporary relief for those employees at the one level, and they'll be able to um, earn and have an earning potential of up to 10% um, more while we go through this transition period. So that was my update as it relates to that. Are there any questions on that matter? Okay. That concludes my update. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I apologize. It was at the bottom of my page. I just missed it. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for your report. Now let's go to our enforcement committee chair, Nancy Springer. Thank you. Um, I believe at this point, Dave is going to um, do presentation with Keith Woods. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dave Hoth. Thank you. Yes, yeah, my pleasure to introduce you to Keith Woods. Keith Woods is the chief executive officer for the North Coast Builders Exchange, one of the largest builders exchanges in the United States. The North Coast Builders Exchange is a 1,250-member organization that provides services to the construction industry in Sonoma, Mendocino, Lake, and Napa counties. These are all counties that have been subject to recent wildfires. Keith has been a leader in ensuring contractors are appropriately licensed, insured, and acting in a professional manner. In addition to a statewide leadership within the construction industry, Keith has been very active in workforce development. I really want to thank Keith for all that he's done. He's hosted many meetings for contractors board staff. Former board member Linda Clifford and I have had quite a few meetings with Keith where we talked about ways that we can improve. We looked at problems in the industry. He really understands the need to bring the contractor community together to have a solution to problems, to identify the truly bad contractors and weed them out of the industry but also looking at some common sense approaches to help contractors to survive in the construction economy. And the reason why he's here today is because we've been hearing about workforce shortages. So Keith's gonna share some of what he's been working with on all of us. So thank you very mu much for joining us this morning, Keith.
not going to be an issue here. <coughs> no, too late. That's, that's, that's pity applause. I, I really don't want that. Uh, sorry, I just arrived. Um, a little trouble parking, uh, but I found a great spot over in Orland, and, and I walked down 32. So a, a treat to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, most mornings I wake up and ask myself, what can I do for David Volk today? And to know that today I can do something. Uh, I'm gonna do three things. If you tell me my time frame, do I have 10 or 12 minutes uh, that you'd grant me here? Then I think I can uh, bring you the information that I know David wanted me to share. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I do work at the North Coast Builders Exchange. Uh, you heard the details there. My background was in Chamber of Commerce work, but I've been at the, the Builders Exchange for the past uh, 20 years as CEO. Uh, I'm gonna do three things very briefly. One pay you a compliment. Uh, <coughs> number two, bring you up to date on, uh, you like that, uh, um, uh, bring you up to date on uh, what's happened in Fireville, the four counties that our organization represents, and then <coughs> tell you a little bit about a success story. Uh, we are uh, training, uh, we are growing our own young workers um, uh, and uh, future contractors, and I just want to do those three things. The compliment is uh, I bow to you for what <coughs> you as an organization and agency and your staff has done to help at least our organization. Uh, we couldn't live without uh, the information that you provide that we pass on to consumers every time we can. Great information that comes from you, Rick, that we use regularly. And uh, I, I'm just so pleased to be uh, so closely associated. We have established a particularly good relationship as a contractors association through David and, and his uh, staff. Uh, 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 the man that made it all happen for us is uh, one of our most active volunteers, a human pit bull named Lee Howard. Perhaps you know him. You may have met Lee in the past. Uh, he is the most dogged defender of and promoter of uh, construction, and we, our organization, uh, couldn't do without uh, Lee and his work. So I, I just thank you for your sting operations, the help we get from Eric Steffens over in our area, and the one-on-one -on -one relationship we have with your registrar has just been uh, outstanding for us. <clears throat> Where are we today? You know that uh, until the utter tragedy that hit the region here up in paradise, uh, I thought I'd never see again the devastation that we experienced in the North Bay. Uh, over the four county <coughs> area, Sonoma Lake, Mendo, and Napa, on uh, the week of uh, October 8th, uh, for at least a week, uh, we lost a little over 7,000 homes, uh, hundreds and hundreds of businesses, and maybe another 10 to 15,000 structures, sheds, garages, barns, etc. It, it was utter devastation and uh, nothing, I, it gives me chills still today to, uh, to remember uh, that time. I got evacuated, uh, lost uh, a condominium that I'm a part owner of, but uh, my the story is not nearly as bad as uh, what others have gone through. We're making progress. It, <coughs> it is two years uh, in the next couple weeks, I guess, we'll celebrate, celebrate. Uh, we'll acknowledge the two-year anniversary of the fires. Uh, of that progress is being made. Our problem has been over the last two years a slow, uh, almost like a hockey stick. Nothing happened for seven or eight months in terms of rebuilding. And finally, as people got their insurance settlements, they found uh, architects, found uh, contractors with the help of our builders exchange. We kind of sprung into action with a tool replacement program, a uh, advice uh, and counsel for all homeowners that are fire victims that needed a builder. We tried to be there for them and stay in our lane and only do the things that we're capable of doing well. Uh, the, uh, the, I, I realized right away, um, within days after the fires hit, and I understood the level of the devastation, we lost more structures, more homes, than we had licensed contractors in the North Bay. That's not a sustainable ratio. Uh, it was a problem from the get-go. Uh, our organization has around 850 licensed contractors. You have to be a licensed contractor to get in. Half of those are generals, half are subs. Most of them became uh, residential builders to help in the cause. We had people coming from Canada, probably 30 different states came in, figuring they could uh, help out while making some money as well. And, and so we uh, have, we're very busy. And what's happened is <coughs> we're about uh, at the two-year mark. Uh, there are uh, out of, in Santa Rosa, I'll give you the number for Santa Rosa, 
3,334 lost homes, uh, and in a county of Sonoma, 5,000. We've got in Santa Rosa about two-thirds of the homes are either <coughs> completed, there are 600 homes that have been completed, and uh, another 1,400 in some form of the review process or under construction. So we're making progress, but uh, it's been long and slow. My, my heart just hurts for Paradise and the difficulties that they're going to have just geographically. We're finding that the rebuilding in our four county area is accelerated in Napa, County because they have access to contractors and workers from Sacramento to Stockton uh, to the East Bay and even in their own county. You get into Sonoma, we lost a lot of Bay Area subcontractors and generals who couldn't uh, have their work, uh, couldn't make it pencil out to have their workers travel from all over the Bay Area. So <coughs> we uh, realized we got a problem and I'll talk about how we're trying to solve it. Uh, <coughs> I really heard for Redwood Valley, which is uh, about half an hour north of Ukiah. Redwood Valley, nobody hears about it, but they lost 560 homes, and they are another hour and a half beyond Santa Rosa with a small contractor base and an even smaller labor base. And so far, I think at a meeting I have with our members up there, two years later, they're maybe 30 to 40 homes that have been completed and other people are desperately trying to figure out as their ALE, their insurance money for rental runs out, there'll be some rapid decisions made. Uh, I go back to uh, the point where uh, uh, we had fewer contractors and we had lost properties and they had fewer workers than they needed. Uh, it was. Uh, clear that we had a labor shortage before the fires. This is nothing, uh, the fires only exacerbated. Uh, everybody from our friends at the unions to our non-union contract, everybody looking for workers, people who get into the union programs, uh, go to work as laborers or workers and contractors that may not, that weren't signatory. We knew we had a huge problem. <coughs> so we had started coincidentally just before the fires, a program called the North Bay Construction Corps. Get used to the name because I, I, I smile when I say it because it's been an, uh, uh, the, the uh, most amazing success story I've experienced in my career, either in chamber work or uh, at the Builders Exchange. We decided we had to grow our own. We didn't care whether they ended up out of our program to go into the unions, to start an apprenticeship, whether they went to work for other contractors. We just knew we couldn't import them. They weren't about to move from Nevada or Texas here. The opposite was going on. So we started a program for high school seniors in their second semester. We experimented the first year, <coughs> which was 2016, uh, 2017, that year. Uh, we uh, experimented with one chapter in a high school. It's a 14-week training program. They go one night a week. They go for two to three hours uh, for, uh, um, in essence, some lecture, some demonstration, some hands-on. They would go to a, a Saturday, to, uh, all day Saturday once a month, and at the end it was a two-week boot camp. The boot camp was really just to get an on, on the job site experience, to weed out those that thought building birdhouses and doghouses is a lot of fun. We wanted them out in 100 degree temperature, uh, uh, doing framing and uh, trying to see what construction was really like. Uh, pilot program, industry driven, it's the key. And make a mental note, this is not a school program, this is industry driven. We partnered with the schools for promotion, we partnered with them for curriculum development, but it was industry driven and it worked. We, <coughs> we graduated seven students the first year, 37 students in the second year, and in our third year that just completed in June, uh, we had expanded with the help of a sizable grant uh, into three chapters in Sonoma County, one in Mendocino, one in Lake, one in Napa, and our friends at the Marin Builders Association said, can we borrow your program? And we said, sure, for the good of the industry. And so they started one up. We ended up in June, uh, uh, 150 students uh, uh, signed up originally for the program in the seven different chapters. We uh, ended up uh, some washout. We had 125 young people, students and coming out of high school that if they weren't going on to architecture school or engineering, they were ready to go in the workforce. And we stressed, uh, you'll be pleased to know, safety, 
was number one, number two was safety, and then number three was safety. Uh, and number four was work ethic. You don't get into construction unless you understand safety and you <coughs> have a demonstrated work ethic. So we put them out at graduation into the marketplaces. 90 of them went through the boot camp. And all over the North Bay, we had hiring events where contractors came in and could interview the students. There were students that got jobs on the spot, see you Monday morning, and it's been an incredible incredible success. We bring in presenters from the industry up to and including <coughs> uh, reps from uh, the, the unions, in particular uh, carpenters and uh, plumbers and others have been very, very cooperative with us. At the hiring event, <coughs> there were 25 companies and representations from several of the unions to say this is a good route for you. And we didn't care where they ended up. We just wanted to get them in the industry. Uh, we're now expanding <coughs> to a fourth chapter in uh, in Sonoma County, a second one in Napa, and, uh, and we're looking at the coastal community in Men uh, Mendocino to see if there's room there. Our goal over the next several years is create uh, three, four, up to 500 new young workers who are already in the area who probably have a better chance of staying there, and we've got to encourage them uh, <coughs> to, to do that. Um, the, uh, at uh, Mr. Vogt's, uh, uh, can I call you Mr. Vogt? Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> uh, at Mr. Vogt's recommendation, uh, I think in a conference call I took part in, uh, we're now adding an element that is at least a taste of what it takes to become a contractor. Uh, because uh, that we tell them their best route to owning their own business, having a good living, is not only being in construction, but becoming a contractor. We will be stealing, um, excuse me, borrowing information galore from CSLB and have an entire component on, okay, once you've developed some skills, here's what it takes so, uh, to become a contractor, so file it away in your memory bank, we tell them, because that it, it's no longer getting into construction because you can't do anything else and you uh, dropped out of college. No, this is a destination occupation now. And it has not been that when, it wasn't that when I first got into uh, this job. Now we're finding parents are just weeping with joy that their kids have a future. And the most prevalent comment we get, the most frequent, is thank you for treating my uh, young man or woman, we've got both in, as an adult. We tell them, this isn't school. You show up on time, you listen, you participate, you work hard, or I'm sorry, but you're gone. There's no charge to the students to get in there. We're having the industry fund it. We got a grant from, uh, through a, a Tipping Point Foundation in San Francisco for the expansion, and we are well on our way to uh, keeping this program alive for years to come. And uh, I brought, uh, uh, I'll leave this for you. It's a summary of the program and the kinds of things that we're training these uh, young people to do. <coughs> I have only one last comment, Mr. Chairman, um, and that is uh, what has uh, come out of this for me is I, I was discouraged at one point about young people and their work ethic. I thought, God, if they couldn't play a video game, that's all they were committed to in life. <coughs> and I really worried about this work ethic. We paint with a broad brush that this uh, generation somehow doesn't have a work ethic. I, I am dazzled by these young people, their commitment, their seriousness about this. They, their desire to get into the industry and the reports back from companies that have hired these students is saying thank you. These are amongst the best workers we've ever had and they've got a real future in the industry. So hopefully they come to you guys for a license someday and uh, that's sort of our ultimate goal. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, any quick question? I know you've got other business and I've got a long hike back to Orland so. Um, <laughs> Anything, going once, twice. Thank you, uh, uh, David, for inviting uh, me, and uh, uh, to stay tuned. We'll keep you apprised on how the program goes, and in fact, we're willing to export it to uh, organizations, contractors groups, builders exchanges, uh, all over the state, because uh, we don't have the ultimate answer, but we sure got one that's on its way to being the answer. So thank you again for letting me uh, come before you. North, oops, sorry. Thank you, Keith, North Coast Builders Exchange for all the work that you're doing. I really appreciate that. Looks like you're moving in a great direction. Thank you. 
Um, as we move into the packet on page 94, um, you can see an article there that um, CSLB's disaster response efforts are not going unnoticed um, by outside agencies. There's an article that was published in July of 2019 in the issue of the Engineering Contractors Association, ECA, a magazine that did an excellent job of recognizing the diligence of CSLB to ensure that the survivors of this state's unprecedented disasters are protected from further victim and victim indication. Sorry about that. Um, so before I turn this over to Missy for further information here, um, I want to acknowledge all the hard work that the um, enforcement staff has been doing, not only through all these disasters, but maintaining their regular workload on top of that. So just a little um, shout out there to staff. So I'm gonna turn it over now to our Chief of Enforcement, Missy Vickery, to share the highlights from the Joint Agency Disaster Response Roundtable. She attended this in July um, at the CSLB headquarters and also to discuss the CSLB's disaster response special projects. Missy. Thank you, Nancy. CSLB hosted a Joint Agency Disaster Response Roundtable on June 30th, July 30th, 2019. Representatives from several state and federal agencies participated in the meeting. On page 95 of your packet, you'll find a list of all attendees. During the meeting, we discussed partnering opportunities such as conducting stings and sweeps in disaster areas and disaster response special projects. I would like to highlight a couple of those projects. PG&E has undertaken a massive preventive tree trimming and removal program to reduce wildfire hazards. We have a pilot program with PG&E where we are working with them to ensure that the more than 140 tree service contractors are in full compliance with state licensing and workers' compensation requirements. That includes establishing a single point of contact between the two agencies to work together. Another special project is that we received more than 100 complaints regarding construction vehicles in declared disaster areas that did not include the name and contractor's number on the vehicles as required. We sent advisory notices and 55% of those confirmed by photograph that they were in compliance within 30 days. Repeat offenders are subject to either a letter of admonishment or a citation. That concludes my update, Nancy. Thank you, Missy. So to conclude this section, please turn to page 97 in your packets. Um, CSLB, CSLB SWIFT Division has been actively partnering with EDD and the California Department of Insurance and multiple DAs to conduct random sweeps and coordinated stings to combat the underground economy in the declared disaster areas. You see that on 97. And then if you turn to page 98, you'll note that between July First, 2018 and July 31st of 2019, SWIFT investigators conducted 52 sweep days across the state resulting in 32 cases to the local DA for criminal prosecution, including multiple felony cases. I'm on the same page um, here, 90, 98, 99. You can see that the extensive list of outreach activities conducted by SWIFT statewide to further help protect those in the affected communities. Are there any board discussion on this item? Kevin? Yes, um, thank you. And uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Woods, for your presentation as well and what you're doing. Um, in, with all of this, the disaster response, you know, we're up here in Butte County. Um, yesterday, Nancy and I had the opportunity to, to go through and, and view some of the devastation firsthand. This is devastation that's a year old. I mean, this is a year old that this town is still struggling just to clean up, let alone rebuild. And I think it's really important that as a board that we remember as a consumer protection unit that we're not allowing these people to be victimized a second time by unscrupulous contractors, that we're doing all we can to make sure that the unlicensed and more importantly that the bad actors that are out here to take advantage of the people of Butte County or the Four Lake County up in uh, the North Bay or any of these disaster areas that they're going to have the weight of the world on their shoulders from CSLB partnering with DA agencies etc and that we're getting out of the way of the good contractors and we're not creating 
further barriers to whether it's licensure or doing the right thing. And I just think it's vitally important. We spend a lot of time talking about a lot of solutions, sometimes looking for problems, uh, a lot of sometimes problems that aren't as big, but at the end of the day, we're a consumer protection organization and there's what, 14,000 homes here, there's 7,000 homes in the North Bay Area counties that we need to make sure that we're protecting those folks from being victimized again. And for those of you that, that have that opportunity to go look, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking to go through that town and see what, what happened there. And remember, that's a year later. So I just, I think it's really important that we always remember why we're here, what our role is, and who we're supposed to protect. Thank you. Well said, Kevin. Any other board discussion? Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, hearing none, moving on. Agenda item E2, enforcement program update. The enforcement program update is outlined on page 101 of your packets uh, with the investigation highlights beginning on page 102. The relaunch of the most wanted list of public, by public affairs in the enforcement division as set out in the strategic plan has proven very effective as you will hear from the investigative highlights today. The first highlight is on page 102. This involves the apprehension of Matthew Breen, one of CSLB's most wanted. Mr. Breen was investigated by CSLB for abandoning three large residential projects and cheating the homeowners out of more than $300,000. Based on CSLB's investigation, Breen was charged by the San Mateo County DA with 13 felonies and four misdemeanors, including grand theft, diversion of funds, elder abuse, identity theft, fraudulent use of contractor's license, and unlicensed contracting. Following the issuance of an arrest warrant, Mr. Breen had fled to Massachusetts and was placed on CSLB's most wanted list on May 13, 2019 due to his fugitive status. The Salem Police Department arrested Breen on August 14, 2019 after receiving a tip from the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office. Breen was then he resisted arrest and as a result is also facing local charges. He was extradited back to California and was arraigned on September 18, 2019. So before we, it's good news there that we have this one in our hands now. So before we discuss the next story, please note that there is an error on page 103 in the middle of the page where it reads, CSLB is pursuing an administration citation against full power construction. This should read, CSLB is pursuing an administrative action against full power construction. So please note that correction. The highlight I just mentioned begins on the bottom of page 102 and is entitled, Unlicensed Contractor Guilty of Using Forced Labor. The summary details the SLB's investigation of an unlicensed contractor on the Silvery Towers project in downtown San Jose. The respondent in this case, Job Torres Hernandez, falsely represented himself as a licensed contractor by using the license of an acquaintance to procure the upscale project. During the project, he recruited over 20 undocumented workers from Mexico. He refused to pay them, he housed them in inhumane accommodations and threatened them and their families with violence and or deportation if they complained or reported of the abuse. The above charges were investigated by the appropriate federal agencies. However, CSLB conducted an independent investigation that supported state crimes of grand theft, theft, embezzlement, contracting without a license, and illegal advertising. Additionally, the licensed acquaintance was found to be aware of the unlicensed activity and was also charged with grand theft and other contracting violations. Mr. Torres Hernandez was sentenced in June 2019 to eight and a half years in federal prison and ordered to pay nearly $1 million to his victims. The Santa Clara County DA served him with the arrest warrant for his construction related charges during his federal incarceration and a $100,000 warrant was issued for his associate. On the bottom of page 104 is a story 
is an additional story that highlights an investigation by CSLB Special Investigations Unit in SWIFT into an unlicensed contractor attempting to further victimize survivors of the North Bay wildfires. Unlicensed contractor Peter Koki arrived in Sonoma County, representing himself as Koki Clean Cleanup, to assist homeowners with debris removal work. Though the investigation, through the investigation, CSLB investigators identified six separate victims, four of which signed contracts valued at nearly $135,000. The Sonoma County DA charged Mr. Koki with grand theft, filing false or forged documents, displaying a license not issued to a contractor with intent to defraud, and acting in the capacity of a contractor without a valid license. Mr. Koki failed to appear at his preliminary hearing in May. This resulted in an issuance of a warrant for his arrest, and he was placed on the CSLB's most wanted list in August of 2019. The general complaint handling statistics can now be found on page 106. And I'm going to turn it over to Chief um, of Enforcement, Missy, to discuss this further. Thank you, Nancy. Staff have been consistent and continuing to achieve board goals and objectives of dispositioning an average of 10 complaints a month. Caseloads remain manageable and staff have successfully assisted in getting more than 25 million in restitution to financially injured parties. SWIFT staff continue to focus on unlicensed and uninsured persons. This has resulted in 974 criminal referrals and 620 stop work orders for no workers comp. On page 108, you will see that SWIFT and our Labor Enforcement Task Force partners were quite successful in their efforts to identify unfair business competition, therefore leveling the pay playing field as they conducted 319 inspections that resulted in 276 contractors out of compliance. That equates to 87% who were in violation of a state law. That concludes my update, Nancy. Thank you, Missy. Is there any board discussion on this item? Seeing none. Is there, are there, is there any public comment on this item? Okay, seeing none there. We'll move on to agenda item E3, which is an update on the CSLB Solar Task Force and State Agency Partnerships. You can find this item on page 110 of your packet, um, with the solar complaint background. The item starts on page 110 um, with this background. Uh, while there are still some very egregious solar complaints being received and investigated, the good news is that the number of solar-related complaints received each month appears to be leveling off, as you can see on the chart in the middle of page 110 there. And speaking with the Chief of Enforcement, uh, much of the focus of the Solar Task Force has been on partnering with other state agencies to address the most egregious acts in various disadvantaged communities across California. Missy, would you please update us on those partnerships and those activities? Yes, thank you, Nancy. CSLB has been working in partnership with the California Public Utilities Commission and the Department of Business Oversight to provide preventative outreach and necessary assistance to consumers who may have or may be victimized by predatory solar sales tactics. These state agencies have formed a task force that meets quarterly. Within the task force, there are three working groups that have been meeting as necessary to achieve the goals that have been set forth. The preventative outreach and education group has developed a bulletin that is shown on page 112 and 113 of your packet. This bulletin was distributed to Fresno County residents via mail by PG&E on September 17, 2019, and is informational for consumers thinking of going solar. Rick Lopes, Chief of Public Affairs, is going to be discussing this bulletin in greater detail later in his presentation for Public Affairs. Coordinated Enforcement Opportunities is another group that is talked about on page 114 of your packet. This group coordinates opportunities to increase enforcement as it pertains to lead generators and misleading sales practices. CSLB has referred complaints to the Department of Business Oversight, and in turn, we have received complaints from um, DBO. The last group is responsible for co coordinating the tracking of interagency referred complaints so we can measure our success. 
On page 114, you will see information regarding the CPUC solar information packet that is a part of a handout. It's not in your packet. This packet was developed by CPUC with CSLB's and other stakeholders' input. Although it's, you should all have a copy. It's actually a really informational packet for anyone thinking of going solar. On July 1st, this English version for the information packet was released and is intended to enable consumers to make informed decisions regarding solar. On August 30th, CPUC released the document in five additional languages. Beginning September 30th, home, homeowners serviced by PG&E, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric Company that have chosen to go solar must initial the first four pages and sign the final page. These documents, along with CSLB's solar disclosure documents, as mandated by AB 1070, must be uploaded to the utility interconnection portals by the solar provider before the consumer can be connected to the grid. Please note that these requirements do not apply to new construction. That concludes my update. Thank you, Missy. Is there any board discussion on this item? Yes. Well, with the languages, out of curiosity, that were important enough to be translated. Spanish. Is it on the front? It's on. It's on the front. Yeah. It Spanish. Um, Tagalog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Korean, Spanish, Tagalog, and Chinese. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll read next time. Tagalog. Any other board discussion? Any um, public comment on this item? Uh, Bernadette Del Chiaro, Executive Director of the California Solar and Storage Association. Um, I really want to compliment um, Ms. Vickery and her team uh, for working uh, with the other agencies as well as with the industry. Um, the CSLB has done an excellent job and, and uh, compliment all of us for getting some decline in the complaint numbers. Um, it's a group effort and we really appreciate all of your, your, all of your hard work. Um, I also want to um, ask a question, and maybe it's for Michael. Um, we've been asking uh, for and following up with the CSLB about issuing a guidance on the authority to, um, uh, to regulate lead generators in, in collaboration with the uh, local AGs or the state AG. Any update on, on that guidance? The lead generation memo? Uh, the, there is a draft. Um, that's oh. not on the agenda, so uh, perhaps you could discuss okay. offline or put it on a future agenda item. Okay, I'll just register our uh, keen interest in, in seeing that memo uh, finalized. And then I just want to also offer, um, we have as the industry adopted some uh, tough new rules on consumer protection that we think will further reduce the number of complaints. I know my colleague uh, Joshua Buswell Charco has made some presentations before the task force, but if anybody at the CSLB is interested in uh, doing a deep dive on that, I just want to make ourselves available. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to agenda item E4 on page 115, 116, and that is review and discussion of 2018 consumer satisfaction survey results. The results of 2018 consumer satisfaction survey starts on page 116. It is impressive to see that through CSLB's internal training and staff's dedication, the scores have improved in most categories. At this point, I will now turn it over to Wendy Balvanez to provide the highlights. Good morning. <laughs> the, the survey report is based on surveys of people who file complaints with CSOB against licensed and unlicensed contractors. It covers complaints closed during the calendar year of 2018 and we reach out through SurveyMonkey to all complainants who provided us with their email addresses. The response rate of 15% is roughly that of other years. The survey results for questions one through eight are best viewed on, in figure two on page 123. The ratings you can see are fairly stable over the years. Small changes from year to year are normal variation. Across the years, the highest rating is always for the question about courteous treatment and the lowest rating is always for the question about the action taken was appropriate. 
The question nine results are on page 120. They cover whether the complainant inquired about the contractor's license prior to hiring. Approximately 42% of the complainants did check out the status of the license of the contractor they were hiring. And then at the very end of the report, um, Appendix A has the survey itself, Appendix B has detailed data, and Appendix C covers the complaint profile. Lastly, any comments that people write in at the end of the survey are provided to enforcement for review and possible content, uh, comment, contact. Comments and possible contact. There we go. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Is there any board discussion on this item? Seeing none. Okay, is there any public comment on this item? Okay, seeing none there. Let's move on to our last agenda item, which is F5, um, regards to enforcement. E5, sorry. And that is the strategic plan. Um, the enforcement update begins on page 136. Missy, please take over and provide us an update here, progress update. Thank you, Nancy. We previously discussed objectives 2.1 through 2.9, so I'm gonna brief you today on items 2.3 and 2.9 where I have an update. For item 2.3, which is in partnership with Public Affairs, develop and implement a plan to identify opportunities to increase publicity concerning enforcement actions, including relaunch of CSLB's most wanted feature. The most wanted feature has been relaunched and two new suspects have been added. As reported earlier, one has been captured and one still remains at large. For item 2.9, which is attend job fairs to promote employment opportunities for CSLB, two staff members have been identified to represent CSLB and are attending a career fair at Sacramento State on September 30th and October 1st. That concludes my update. Thank you, Missy. Is there any board discussion on this item? Seeing none. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, well that, con thank you all, and that concludes the enforcement section. Thank you, Nancy. Um, before we go on, are there any, uh, any board comments on enforcement? Any public comments on board enforcement? Seeing none. Let's take a 15-minute uh, uh, break. I know some folks have to feed, uh, feed the meters, and so we'll take a little bit longer so you can get to your cars.